Uh, well, I've had a day and a half of sort of solid talking to wonderful graduate students and faculty here, and I feel like this is today, right now, this, this seminar is sort of the capstone of my experience here. I hope to come back. I hope also, I would like also to welcome all of you to come to University of Utah to uh, experience some of our graduate students and our faculty as well. Um, we're not very far away, just down the road, um, and I think it would be rewarding for you guys and rewarding for us. Um, today is sort of my, I don't know how many of you went to my talk yesterday, which was mainly about broader impacts and public engagement, but today what I'd like to do is to talk to you about and kind of summarize the research that I've been doing over the last, I hate to say it, 35 or 40 years. Um, this is me at the beginning of my research uh, career, uh, where I was really sort of wondering about um, things in tropical rainforests, how I might come to carry out ecological research in tropical rainforests that would be meaningful for me and, and hopefully to um, provide some knowledge, some ways of knowing of a part of, the can a part of the rainforest, which at that time was very, very poorly known. The forest canopy was called the last biotic frontier by Terry Irwin. It was a place where people hadn't really even climbed into or discovered. But since then, over these 35 years, I and my students and colleagues, um, I think, have made some progress in terms of understanding the complex interactions, the species, um, the transfers of nutrients um, and the uh, interactions that go on in tropical cloud forests, especially forest canopies. And as I climbed into forest trees, what I sort of decided my work would be is answering this question, how do canopy communities function in the, can how do canopy communities function in the forest and how does their presence affect the forest as a whole? Um, so what I'd like to do really is sort of use this opportunity as kind of a retrospective of a lot of the work that my students and I have done. And I'd like to, sort of the first part of the seminar, I'd like to talk to you about the work that I've done in primary forest re, uh, canopies, uh, focusing on first the, the composition and biomass of canopy epiphytes, and secondly, some of their ecosystem functions that we have documented. In the second half of the seminar, I'd like to think about disturbance and recovery. We're all aware of disturbances in tropical rainforests, um, and so I'd like to sort of present this in a progressive way, first starting with disturbance and recovery at the branch level, then at the forest level, and finally at the sort of ecosystem slash global level. Um, I'll just uh, acquaint you with the two field sites where I've done the most of my work. Uh, one of them is in Monteverde, Costa Rica, right along the central cordillera, uh, where you get this amazing cloud forest with lots of mist and fog and wind that is a primary sort of climatic driver of that forest. And secondly, in the temperate rainforest of Washington State, on the west side of the Olympic Peninsula, where you get just massive accumulations of epiphytes and dead organic matter in the canopy as well. In both the temperate and the tropical rainforest canopy, when you go up into the canopy, you're really experiencing a very different world than what you experience when you walk around on the sort of dark, damp, windless forest floor. Rather, in the canopy, you experience much greater uh, extremes of temperature and relative humidity, much greater amounts of wind, and really much more the atmosphere is sort of an open field than what you find on the forest floor. And for these reasons, that is the differences in microclimate, as well as the different architecture, the different architecture of the substrate itself uh, in the forest canopy, that is plants growing on these tubular branches uh, that are sort of suspended in three-dimensional space, there have been a, a huge number of plants and animals that have adapted their lives and their life cycles and their lifestyles uh, to accommodate these different degrees of microenvironment and, and canopy substrate. So we have literally thousands of species of vascular and non-vascular epiphytes um, and an accompanying very large diversity of, of vertebrates and invertebrates. One of the things that you encounter in tropical cloud forests and temperate rainforests that I find, for whatever reason, I do not know why I find them so intriguing, but canopy soils have sort of struck in my heart and my mind as, as an area of research to find out about these soils. They're, they're, com they're really comprised of the dead and decomposing live epiphytes uh, that are perched on that tree. Basically, they die and decompose in place. They build up this, this organic matter, and they really constitute a histosol, an organic soil soil that occurs on the branches and trunks of basically every tree surface in these forests. My students and I have spent quite a lot of time in the early stages of my research trying to characterize and compare this canopy-held organic matter to the organic matter and soils on the forest floor. And just very briefly, the major sort of salient differences between the forest floor soils and the canopy soils are that canopy soils are much more acidic, one or two um, units of pH more acidic. 
They have much lower rates of nitrification, that is the, the conversion of ammonia to uh, nitrate. They have similar mo microbial biomass, and we'll talk about bio, uh, microbes a little bit later in my talk. They have a lower invertebrate density, uh, diversity and density, and uh, most interestingly in terms of sort of plant nutrient uptake and water uptake, um, they experience more frequent dry downs in the forest canopy than what we see in soils on the forest floor. So with that background of the sort of the biomass or the composition of the epiphytes in uh, tropical, uh, tropical cloud forests, I'd like to move into talking about ecosystem function. And I was trained as an ecosystem ecologist, so I tend to think of forests as systems uh, rather than being so interested in you know, the taxonomy of orchids or who's actually up in the forest canopy. I'm more interested in the why questions. What are these canopy communities actually doing or functioning as in these tropical forests? And I started out most of my sort of major work uh, from the standpoint of nutrient cycling, of trying to understand what is the nutrient uh, storage of these canopy plants, what are the nutrient inputs from rainfall and mist and dry deposition, and how are those nutrients transferred to other parts of the forest ecosystem. And again, some of my early work was, was really purely descriptive. Uh, my students and I did a lot of uh, climbing into trees and taking samples of cutting branches, lowering them to the forest floor in order to come up with ecosystem level estimates of the biomass and nutrient capital that is held in forest canopies in the epiphytic component. Our general result in the tropical montane forest of Monteverde is that there's about 33 metric tons per hectare of epiphytic material, both live and dead. About 14, this is about equivalent to 14% of the total above ground forest biomass. And when you look at just the foliar <coughs> biomass of the, of the epiphytes compared to the host trees, actually epiphytes have 4.4 times the total foliar biomass than the, than the host trees themselves. Well, this is kind of boring when you think about, you know, just pools of biomass and nutrients. But I think what's more exciting, of course, are the dynamics of, of, of nutrients coming into the system, being stored in the system, and moving around the system. So I'd like to talk a little bit about what we have found out in terms of nutrient inputs. Um, a student named Ken Clark uh, did a lot of work with looking at inputs of nutrients uh, from rainfall and mist. Every single droplet of rain and mist that comes into the forest has at its center a little particulate matter, a little bit of dust around which water vapor coalesces. And so when you get mist and rain coming into a system, when it's intercepted, when it's held on to um, a leaf or moss or, the, or dead organic matter itself, it adds to the nutrient capital of that system. And in the cases of mist and fog moving through the forest canopy, these are nutrients that come from outside the system. So we have an alloctonous source, and those epiphytes then are building up the nutrient capital of the canopy and the forest as a whole. Well, we might ask, how does that material in the canopy fall to the forest floor and contribute to the, uh, the nutrient capital of the forest as a whole? We first looked at the litter fall of the trees themselves, the sort of classical, most studied nutrient transfer of, of all forests, and that is host tree litter fall, we found that there was about uh, 7.7 7 tons per hectare per year, which is kind of normal for tropical montane forests. But we also measured the um, epiphytic component of the, of the nutrient transfer. We started out with a typical little bucket, you know, that you put out there to collect leaves, and we kept finding that our buckets were being hit by branches and collapsing and being crashed into. And we sort of were tearing our hair out when we realized that this was, this was not a bad thing to happen. It made us realize that, in fact, epiphytic material comes down very differently than the gentle rain of leaves. And so we had to make these five by five meter plots, clear out the epiphytes, and then make measurements of how the epiphytes were coming down. What we found that litter fall was about 15% from the epiphytes, about 15% of what we found with the host tree litter, and that there was really no seasonality in this. They fell in big clumps. They fell in small bits of mosses. It was really quite a different dynamic in terms of the input of epiphytic litter fall compared to host tree litter fall. Another nutrient transfer we realized as we were sitting up in the forest canopy for hours at a time was through a mechanism I began calling epislides. That is these sort of micro avalanches of epiphytes that would fall off spontaneously or moved off by an arboreal mammal and which would then um, cause these epiphytes to fall to the forest floor. Sometimes they would ride down branches or whole trees and tree falls, but we, see, we saw that this might be a significant pathway of nutrient transfer. 
Um, what we were able to do was not, we weren't able to quantify the rate at which this was going on. It's very sporadic in terms of time and space, but we, were, we did notice that when these epiphytes fall to the forest floor, they basically disappear pretty quickly. And we carried out, I, I sort of used to call that moss meltdown, you know, that you would see these big clumps of mosses and epiphytes and organic matter, and as you would walk through week after week, you would notice that it, it sort of disappeared. So we carried out a study where we looked at the rate of disappearance of these fallen epiphytes. We took patches of epiphytes that had recently fallen. We marked them. Um, and, what, and this is a, sort of a demographic. This is the plants, the percent of plants alive over a stretch of nearly three years. We found that about 40% of them <clears throat> died and disappeared within about six months, which is a pretty rapid turnover. Of only about 7% lasted for, for more than two years. So clearly, this this pool of nutrients and carbon uh, of biomass that's accrued through the interception and retention of atmospheric nutrients then are falling to the forest floor at some rate, decomposing, and those nutrients then are available for uptake um, by terrestrially rooted plants. There was another um, sort of uh, pathway of nutrient transfer that I'd like to talk about briefly, and this I discovered when I was a graduate student actually climbing in the temperate rainforest. When I started pulling back these mats of live epiphytes and canopy soils, I discovered that some trees, like big leaf maple, actually have roots that permeate this canopy soil that are that come out of the branches and the trunks of the trees themselves. Um, these are viable roots. Some of them reach the thickness of my wrist. Um, they have root hairs. They are active in root uptake, in nutrient and water uptake. Um, as I began doing travels around the world looking for these canopy roots, um, I found that they occur in many ty types of wet forests wherever, um, it, wherever you get a large accumulation of live and dead material in the forest canopy. So the picture then that I was able to imagine having worked on this sort of canopy, within canopy nutrient cycling and between canopy and forest floor nutrient cycling is that nutrient storage can be up to 15% of the total above ground biomass, that as much as 60% of those nutrients can be absorbed and retained uh, within the forest canopy, that nutrient transfer does occur through epiphyte fall and other sources, that there's decomp decomposition and release of those nutrients, and there's even kind of a shortcut of nutrient transfer between the epiphytes their organic matter, and the host trees that support them within the canopy. So a far more complex picture of nutrient cycling than what we might typically think of as a, as a, temp a regular temperate rainforest without the presence of epiphytic material. Well, most of this work, in fact, all of this work that I just described, um, I carried out in these primary temperate and tropical rainforests. But of course, we all are aware, and I became increasingly aware <clears throat> through time, that, this, that primary rainforests were not the only kinds of rainforests uh, that were to be studied and understood. Um, that disturbance was a factor that, was, that has become a more and more major part of tropical ecosystems. And so as my work has continued, I've, be, I've become more and more kind of affixed to the idea of trying to understand the effects of various kinds of disturbance, both natural and human, on the dynamics, the recovery um, of the composition, uh, the characteristics, and especially the functions of canopy communities in the face of different kinds of disturbance. So I'd like to sort of switch gears now and go from describing the primary rainforest canopy characteristics and functions to ask the question of how do disturbances at different spatial scales affect forest canopies? And I'll start first with the branch level and talk about physical disruption. I'll go to the forest level and talk about the isolation of trees from the primary forest as a, as a sort of mechanism of disturbance. And finally, talk about um, disturbance at the landscape or global level through the processes of, of climate change. So um, if we look at the branch level, I, I, I mentioned that we get these natural epi slides, and I was wondering how long does it take these, these epiphytic communities to recover. I had predicted that this would happen very quickly because of the lush, abundant nature of the epiphytic communities up there. And early on in my career, I started just um, sort of clearing patches of epiphytes from their host trees um, and, and came back each year subsequently to measure uh, what, what was coming back. And I had presumed that this would be very rapid, that there would be encroachment from the side, and I would be unable to discern very quickly where those uh, disturbance has, disturbances had taken place. <clears throat> 
Uh, what I learned was the opposite, that when I, after removal, this is in years, this is percent cover on the y-axis, that it took a very long time, it took about 13 years for anything to come back. These branches were bare as a baby's bottom. It was like every year I'd come back and expect to see mosses growing in from the side, but I didn't. And it wasn't really until 22 years after those initial strip strippings of epiphytes that we got about 40% cover. And even now, 35 years after I took those initial strippings, I can still, when I climb those same trees, I can still see the vestiges of these slight depressions in the areas where these epiphytes have returned. The other thing I learned was that these epiphytes did not return via encroachment, but rather they grew from the bottom up. And my supposition is that when you think about a lot of sunlight on the top of a branch, after a rainstorm, you can see that the bottom of the branch is still wet. And this is where the algae and the mosses uh, and the bryophytes start growing because they need that moisture. And very gradually then over time, they start growing up and around that branch and then make some material that can hold on to water, that has some texture that can capture and hold on to propagules of mosses, of bromeliads and orchids and so forth, which then moves forward the process of succession. So that's just a little bit about um, physical disruption within the canopy and its effects on the recovery of epiphytic communities. What I'd like to talk about next in terms of sort of within branch, within tree dis disturbance, is a study that I carried out just a couple of years ago that was about the physical disruption between the canopy and the forest floor. What happens when epiphytes are dislodged and fall to the forest floor? What might be the rates of decomposition? What might be the, might, might be the mechanisms um, that affect these epiphytes that fall to the forest floor? And this, uh, I designed an experiment to ask a question about what happens to epiphytes when they fall to the forest floor. Um, I hired an arborist who cut down whole limbs of these big leaf maple trees in the Olympic rainforest. We then cut them into segments, we can see over there. We labeled those and we set up an experiment um, where we had the opportunity uh, to compare a number of treatments. And I'd like to just go through these treatments to describe uh, what we set up in order to understand the processes of response to this disturbance. So we had a number of treatments, some were in the canopy, some were on the forest floor. The replicate was really a, 70, a 75 centimeter chunk of these branches that had living epiphytes and dead organic matter coating them. We had some in the canopy, some on the ground. Some of the canopy uh, replicates were attached to the branches. That is, they were the true controls. We hadn't done any cutting of those. Those were truly attached controls. So those we called canopy attached. We also have a set that we called canopy severed. That was a segment of branch that we then took back up to the canopy and tied up into the canopy so that the canopy attached and the canopy severed were experiencing the same microclimate. The only difference was that the branch had been cut off at, from the, any sort of transfer from the upper distal parts of the branch to the bottom and that these branches were then not alive. In terms of the ground, we had a treatment we called perched. That is, we had mosses on the branch that were placed on the ground. So the, the mosses and the dead organic matter were not actually physically touching the ground, but were rather perched on that branch. And the fourth treatment were what we called canopy flat, where we took them out of the epiphytes and dead organic matter and placed it right on the ground. So there was no intervening branch. And I'll show you pictures of these. Oh, so what we were then able to do then is that we were able to test with our measurements the difference between canopy attached and canopy severed would tell us something about the importance of the connection to a living tree. The ground perched versus ground flat would be tell us something about how important is it that they have contact or not with the ground. And comparing the canopy severed with the, canopy per uh, with the ground perched would tell us something about canopy versus ground level. So if you can hold those in your mind uh, for just a minute, I'll tell you what we found. But first, I'll show you just some images of each, of each of these treatments. This is the canopy attached. That is, they were just, it was just a regular branch. No, no cutting had gone on. This is an image of the canopy severed, where we hung up these little segments up into the canopy. This is the ground perched, where we actually had the branch with the epiphytes on top perched on the ground. And then finally, this is ground flat, where the mats themselves were on the forest floor. With this experiment continued for two and a half years, we'd go out to the rainforest every one to three months, and we used what we called a vitality index. We didn't make physiological measurements on the mosses, but rather just gave them a rating from one to five. 
um, over that time. Uh, we had two observers making those measurements, so that sort of calibrated that subjective measurement. And here's what we found. We found significance for each of these pairs. That is, uh, there was a significant difference between the connection uh, between the attached and the severed in terms of vitality. The canopy, the canopy attached was much more, uh, had a higher vitality index. In terms of the ground, the contact with the ground had an effect. The, um, those that were on branches, perched on the branches, had a higher vitality index than those that were flat. The flat, those who were on the flat really just disappeared and decomposed very quickly. And finally, there was a level effect, that those in the canopy lasted longer and had a higher vitality factor than those on the forest floor. This image, this graph right here, is sort of an image of the dynamics, uh, starting with day number zero to 800, looking at the vitality indices here. You can see that the um, ground, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the uh, ground perch, or the, uh, sorry, the ground flat has the lowest vitality index, followed by the ground perched, the canopy severed, and finally the canopy attached. Well, we might ask, you know, why this these patterns might be. Um, I think an obvious, an obvious answer between canopy and forest floor is the microclimate. Uh, one of my students, Dennis Aubrey, carried out some measurements of the moisture content of the canopy organic matter, uh, canopy organic matter and the ground, the ground soils over a year, and he found a distinct dry down during the, the summertime, which is evocative of what I talked about in, that, in the tropical rainforest, that there are these dry downs that the canopy soil experiences that the forest floor does not. And so when we think about these dry downs, which are indicated here with the red arrows, you can see a little bit of a, of a wet season rebound in some of these measurements. Uh, that is, after the dry season, there's actually a rebound, an increase in vitality um, in almost all, all of these. However, um, this doesn't really explain the difference between the attached versus severed, does it? It does because those were supposedly the same microclimate going on in the forest canopy. So it seemed that there was something else going on here besides simply microclimate. And as trying to figure this out, I thought, well, maybe you know, it's the microbes. Everybody always thinks it's microbes that explain everything. Um, and so I started a collaboration with one of our wonderful professors at the University of Utah, Billy Brazelton, <clears throat> and also an, at that time an undergraduate named Cody Dangerfield, whom I believe is in the back row of the audience here because he's a new graduate student here at Utah State University. And um, our group, our little group of three then, uh, did a, a comparison of the microbial communities in the samples that we had, the canopy attached, the canopy severed, the ground perched, and the ground flat. And I'd like to go over just very briefly some of the results that we got from that investigation. So um, <clears throat> just to explain what we did and walk through this community microbial analysis, uh, Cody basically, um, <clears throat> well, what we did was we, we first defined species as any as, as, and <clears throat> as the unique sequence of nucleotides. Um, you can see the, these three species here have a unique signature um, in terms of their, uh, their genetic composition. From these hundreds of thousands of sequences, Cody then identified the number of unique species that each sample generated. So you can see here that in the canopy attached for species one, there were 20, our count was there 24. Um, <clears throat> uh, we then analyzed the differences and similarities of these microbial communities for the different treatments and the results for which these bacterial communities showed differences. Uh, what we also did was create these species-specific differential abundance analysis, uh, where I think you can see these red dots indicate different species, that is, those that were not common to, that were different in the canopy versus the forest floor. So the red dots are those that are distinct, and the black dots are those that are common. So here's the results, uh, just sort of general results from the samples that had a connection, that tested the connection with the living tree. So here we're testing the difference between the canopy attached on the top and the canopy severed on the bottom. And you can see there are lots and lots of red dots there. There are distinct communities in the canopy attached versus the canopy severed. And these bars over here are indicators of the general, sort of the general classification, like chloroplast bacteria um, and various other of other classification or other categories of bacteria. And I just show this to you in that there are different, sort of at the community level, there seem to be quite large differences as well as uh, differences in the actual uh, makeup of this community from the standpoint of species. <clears throat> 
So here we have on the top the connection, testing the difference between the connection with the ground, uh, the ground perched versus the ground floor or ground flat. Again, we see a large number of species that are distinct to the ground perched versus the ground flat. And again, a difference in terms of the categories of microbes that exist in those communities. And finally, the canopy versus ground level, the canopy severed versus the ground perched. Again, we see distinctive communities. So, this, these microbial studies that we have done as sort of preliminary, a preliminary look at the microbial communities really match what we found with the vitality indices, that there was a significant difference between a connected versus an unconnected sample, that there is a difference between being touching the ground versus not touching the ground if you're an epiphytic sample, and there's also a difference between canopy and forest floor level. So we have certainly not explained the whole dynamics or the reasons and the processes behind what goes on when an epiphyte mat falls to the forest floor. But what I learned from this is that there are some nice connections between doing these sort of gross level experiments, looking at vitality as an indicator, and combining those with microbial studies, which are beginning to get to look at some of the movers and shakers and the processes that are aligned with the, the, um, the patterns that we see. Um, so we've talked a little bit about the branch level of, uh, of disturbances, and now I'd like to go to the forest level and think about another kind of disturbance, which is the isolation of individual trees with their canopies from primary rainforests. Um, this is something that's going on in the tropics at a very rapid rate. Uh, that is the isolation of trees and the conversion of primary forests to agricultural uses, especially pastures. Uh, what we find is that there are isolated trees that are at varying distances from their primary forests, but these trees had actually grown up in the environment, the biotic and abiotic environment of the primary forest. And pa um, farmers leave trees and pastures for a variety of reasons. Uh, Bill Haber and Cecilia Harvey actually did a survey of farmers asking them why they leave pasture trees. And the answers range from the fruits, medicinal, medicinal plants that they harvest, shade for their cattle, aesthetics, uh, and, and sort of spiritual values to have, to have trees around. So for all of those reasons, there are existing um, these fragments that have been shrunk down to a single tree. And one of my questions was, how might these relic tree canopies maintain ecosystem function in montane landscapes? That is, I talked in the very first part of my talk about all the ecosystem functions that these epiphyte communities perform in primary untouched forest, forest ecosystems. And my question is whether those ecosystem functions might persist in these, these isolated trees as well. And I'd like to talk about two ways that they might continue to function. One is in terms of their seed banks, that is the canopy organic matter that they hold in their canopies that might have seeds that they have stored over time they, uh, and to understand how those seed, whether those seeds are out there and how they might function. And secondly, how these trees might serve as way stations uh, for pollinators or dispersers of fruits uh, between the primary forest and these relic trees. So I'll first start with this idea of seed bank repositories. Um, some of the work that's gone on in uh, Monteverde and other cloud forest ecosystems has shown us the importance of seed banks in the terrestrial soil, that seeds, fruits, and then seeds uh, retain their uh, vitality and their ability to germinate and sprout when a tree fall, a small or large tree fall occurs, and that the seed bank is actually a very important part, very important process of regeneration. And what we did was sort of in a novel way, we said, well, there's organic matter in the canopy. It's been exposed to fruits and seeds as well. What is the seed bank in those soils? And so my assistant, Rodrigo Solano, who had worked on a seed bank project uh, earlier and was able to identify these many, many seeds that are stored in the, in the forest canopy soils, was able to identify these. Um, and what we found after doing an analysis of seed banks in the canopy soils of pasture trees versus forest trees was that, in fact, these seed banks are very similar in terms of abundance, in terms of the diversity of species that occur in those seed banks, in terms of the pollination syndromes. Are they bird dispersed, bat dispersed, wind dispersed? Uh, in terms of their successional sat status, in terms of their growth habits, and in terms of their dispersal groups. So, in fact, then, these seed banks that are out there in the middle of pastures are indeed quite similar to those that we found in the forest, uh, the primary forest. And we might ask then, well, 
So what? What happens to them? Are they viable or not? And we've done some preliminary experiments. Um, as we know, they fall down to the forest floor, uh, either by just following the mats themselves through epi slides or riding down these branches and tree falls. Um, and we did some greenhouse experiments finding, and we have found out that those seed banks are indeed viable. They do sprout when they're exposed to sunlight and moisture. And so they might then serve as sort of a time capsule uh, that is bringing these, these seed banks when they fall down to be able to kind of sprout in these pasture ecosystems um, <clears throat> as, they, as they fall and then grow. Uh, there's one more aspect of isolated trees that I'm just currently exploring now. And I feel a little bit, I don't know, a little bit nervous about putting this out here to you. But to me, it's like so intriguing and such a, like a cool idea. I'm going to put it out anyway. Um, this is an idea that really brings in interdisciplinary thinking and learning. And as I mentioned, I'm, I'm really desperately interested in these relic trees. Uh, I wrote a grant proposal to NSF um, saying, well, I really want to study these. but the reviewer said, well, this is an interesting question, no doubt. And you, know, you can do the work at Monteverdi, but there's no theory about relic trees in the literature. So whatever you learn at Monteverdi may not be generalizable uh, beyond what you do in your own field site. And of course, when you get a rejection like that from NSF, you feel very bad. Um, but I said, well, you know, maybe other fields that deal with disturbance and recovery might have some theory that I could borrow. I might be able to use their tools and practices. And so the University of Utah has this really cool feature called Find a Researcher. And what you do is you just type in keywords. I typed in disturbance and recovery. And what comes up is all the faculty that study that term. So popped up 20 faculty members from all over campus, from all of these fields of refugee studies, populations that are disturbed when they're moved from South Sudan to Salt Lake City, uh, macroeconomics, economic systems that are disturbed through a, a recession or a depression and then somehow recover. Uh, human development, attach we had a psychology professor who studies human attachment theory. That is when a baby, when a parent disappears through death or divorce, there's, a, there's an effect, a disturbance effect on that child, not only when it's a baby, but very often later in life, it learns not to trust people. And so there's a whole study of attachment theory in terms of disturbance and recovery. Um, neuroscience, we know now that neurons are capable of, of, of serving really as relic structures, of, of, of using neuro or displaying neuroplasticity, uh, changing their function when there's a head trauma or a stroke. So neuroscientists know a lot about disturbance and recovery in relic structures. Modern dance, we know, uh, involves, is an art form. And modern dance, as many other art forms, relies on disturbance, right? If there were no disturbance of ballet, we would all be doing, you know, jetés. We wouldn't have modern dance. So modern, this modern dance professor said that disturbance is an integral part of the arts and something to be understood and welcomed because it, progress, it, it allows the arts to progress. Urban planning, we can think about um, <clears throat> the, the, the faculty member we had was very interested in the effects of Hurricane Katrina on New Orleans and the idea that there was disturbance and recovery. Uh, there were relic structures that allowed, in some cases, uh, faster recovery and in some cases, slower recovery in terms of the infrastructure. Of all of these fields. Well, what happened during this seminar that I, I called together, we met twice, uh, we met once a month for two hours for an entire academic year. The first month we talked about how we each in our own discipline talks about and understands the theory, the tools, the practices of disturbance and recovery. We all went around the room and did this. And then the second semester, um, we talked about emergent properties, things that were common in disturbance and recovery. We also talked about how one person from one field might borrow or use the tools and practices of another field. And so it turned out that I had the most sort of connection with the traffic engineer, an engineer named R.J. Porter. And what he told me, or he told the group, was that traffic engineers do not look at traffic as individual cars. Certainly cars are particulates. But when they start moving together, uh, they're actually considered a flow, like a river, a river of cars moving. And so there's a tremendous amount of work that's been done in terms of collecting data on, on traffic as a flow. But all of that is grounded in fluid dynamic theory and flow theory, very, very solid physics-based theory. 
So traffic engineering then has a whole body of theory behind it in terms of measuring the flow of individual units from one place to another, which is really what I was interested in in trying to understand the movement of birds from the primary forest to that relic tree. And I realized that instead of just counting one bird after another the way I was used to doing it, which way, you know, bird ecologists look at it, if we could think of that, that bird movement as a flow, we might be able to use some of the theory, some of the tools and practices um, that civil engineering and traffic engineering have given us. So the predictive power of using fluid dynamics and flow theory allows RJ Porter and other traffic engineers to predict and to mitigate and model the movement of, 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 those, of those individual entities in space and time. And so I would be able, if I used his, his theory and his practices, what R.J. Porter told me was, well, if I have data about movement, the number of birds to each tree, um, I might be able to then predict whether it would be better to leave trees, relic trees, in a pasture in this sort of leapfrog format, or whether it would be better to clump them. And so what right now we're sort of putting together ideas in terms of how we might take the theory, the tools, and the practices of traffic engineering and relate them to how we can understand the flow of birds, of dispersers, and even of pollen or spores from one place to another within tropical landscapes. I told you I was sort of taking a risk and <laughs> trying to put that out there. But for me, I think it's very practical. So one of my postdocs, Kimberly Sheldon, has now been working in tropical montane pastures in Monteverde. She's been recording the visits of birds to these relic trees and has found that, in fact, tree size, the larger trees, uh, their epiphyte loads, and their relic status, relic rather than colonizing trees, makes a difference to the birds in terms of their movements uh, from the primary forest out to these relic trees. <clears throat> the last thing I'd like to talk about is um, disturbance at an even larger scale, the landscape scale or the global scale. And um, the obvious uh, sort of driver in, in disturbance at this scale is, of course, climate change. And this is something that's very important in tropical montane forests. Probably right after polar systems, tropical montane forests are the most vulnerable to climate change of any other ecosystem in the world. Um, we're very concerned about changes in not only rainfall, the amount of rainfall, but also the amount of mist that's delivered. And in fact, there have been a number of papers that have relied on um, global climate change models that have predicted that clouds, the cloud surface shifts will be 200 meters upward in another 10 years, and there will be less mist uh, during the Monteverde dry season <clears throat> during that time as well. So the idea is that as we get warming land and sea temperatures, uh, it, it, the, we get this lifting of the mist that goes further and further up the mountain. Um, and so uh, what we see is that <clears throat> the trees and the epiphytes are going to be exposed to less mist over time. But being as old as I am, I don't even have 10 years left of tree climbing in me to understand and measure and document the effects of climate change on, on tropical montane epiphytes. And so I used sort of as a surrogate a tr to try to answer the question of what is going to be the effect of less mist and fog of higher temperatures that are going to be coming up? What is going to be the effect on these epiphytic communities? I used as a surrogate the altitude. That is, as we move from the lower altitudes to the upper altitudes, we get um, a, an increasing amount of mist and fog, so we can actually transfer or transplant um, epiphyte mats that we cut off and place on trees slightly lower down the slopes that are naturally exposed then at this time to less mist and fog. We first carried out some control experiments where we actually took mats of epiphytes, again, 75 centimeters long. We took them from the top of the canopy, we took them down, we drove them around for a while, and then we put them right back into the, tree, the same tree, and we compared our measurements of growth and productivity to intact mats that were adjacent to them. We found that um, with our measurements, which were leaf mortality, uh, leaf productivity and plant longevity, that there were actually no significant differences between those, the control intact trees and the control, uh, the control um, mats that we moved around. So we realized then that the, the action of moving them around from one place to another did not have a negative or significant impact on these measures of growth. <clears throat> 
Well, we did find that there was, as we moved them to a mid-elevation and a lower elevation site that got progressively less exposure to mist and fog, uh, that we found very distinctive uh, changes in those epiphyte mats. Uh, this is a, a fresh um, uh, epiphyte mat that was established at the beginning of the study, and this was the same mat um, <clears throat> about a little over a year later. Uh, this is, I'll just show you one graph of all of the species combined. <clears throat> this is the months of the year on the bottom axis and the percent survivorship. The top line are the upper, uh, the upper elevation um, epiphyte mats that were exposed to lots and lots of mist and fog. The, the red line is the middle elevation, which had uh, slightly less mist and fog. And then you can see much lower survivorship uh, with that survivorship uh, with the black triangles, which were the lowest elevation that were subjected to the least mist and fog. And our conclusions, so our results or conclusions were that plants whose mats were exposed to reduced mist input experience lower leaf production, higher leaf mortality, and, <clears throat> and reduced plant longevity. So there appears to be, at least from these transplant experiments, a very negative consequence of what is predicted to be the, the climate and weather regimes that this tropical montane forest experiences or will experience in the future. So um, I guess sort of in conclusion, what I would like to say is I feel that I've been very fortunate as a researcher to be able to get in on the so-called ground floor of canopy research, of being able to get up into the canopy um, as one of the few people who were studying it 35 years ago, and to be able to carry out really purely descriptive studies, just what is up here, what is it doing to the rest of the forest, and to have that luxury of simply sort of basic question answering, asking and answering. And I feel that although that time may be a little bit past because now there are so many can canopy studies this has a, the area has attracted so many researchers, that early stage of discovery, I think, has really passed us. Um, but I think what it means then is that the researchers who are now moving into the canopy, like Jesse, who's doing some amazing work with canopy soils, um, and Bonnie as well, have the opportunity to build on what our us as earlier researchers have produced. And I think that there are many questions that remain I think that the landscape of forest canopies has shifted tremendously, um, both in a real way and also in a sort of urgent need for research in these kinds of ecosystems in terms of canopy composition, biomass, and especially function. And so I would say that there are as many questions that remain um, in terms of understanding the forest canopy, both within the canopy, uh, both between the canopy and the forest floor, and understanding what this part of the ecosystem that has been so intriguing to me might afford researchers in the future. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions. That was a great talk. Thank you. Um, Thanks. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if we know anything about like functional gene abundance and how that differs between the treatments or even the forest floor and how that may be driving differences in the theory of the biochemical fluxes. Yeah. Um, I mean, in some ways, I was kind of a little over my head in terms of, uh, of being able to explain beyond what I, I talked about. Um, there are a lot of people, I think, here, perhaps in the audience, who know more about this than I do. But... I think in terms of, you know, when we were looking at these, this, these little dots really represent what might be called species or, you know, your, your taxonomic unit, if that's what you call, want to call a microbe. And this was, I think, Billy's and, and Cody's attempt to try to get at the question you're getting at, which is, what is the function of all of this? And I have to say that in our own study, which we just published last year in Pure J, if you're interested in that article, um, I think we sort of got to the point of, of descri again, of descriptive work that we don't know what in, in terms of, yeah, they're different, but so what? And what, who are the elements and who are the, the shakers and movers and who are the players in terms of determining that? We can, we can look at the results of the microbial activities. That is, I can say, well, these guys on the forest floor decompose more quickly. Those on severed branches, uh, se severed branches decomposed more quickly and had a lower vitality than those that were attached. And presumably that's related to 
to the microbes that are up there. But there's a big divide in terms of understanding the patterns that we, that we, that we documented, the composition which we documented, but the process or the, the function, as you say, bet between those two. So again, luckily, I'm an older professor. I don't have to worry about that myself. But I want to urge graduate students who are into this um, to, to really take up those questions. And that, that's exactly what I meant when, at the very end of my talk when I said I think that I and my older colleagues have set the stage for answering the kinds of questions that you just raised, which is let's get beyond pattern and go into process so that we can get to prediction, so that when some of these micro uh, communities might be affected by climate change or differences in climate, we might be able to make a prediction as to how that will affect the tree, the branch, the forest, and the landscape. Yeah, in the back. Your um, application of fluid dynamics is fascinating, and I'm glad you brought it up. Oh, good. And, uh, I'm glad there were no tomatoes there, yeah. <laughs> Mm. Interesting. You know, I wish R.J. Porter were here by my side. And, and one of the things he has said is that, you know, rivers can flow at different rates, but the theory behind it should still hold. And I think that is the power of his theories of fluid dynamics for explaining and predicting his traffic patterns. I don't know if there's sort of a lower limit in terms of, or a lower, if there's a density limit in terms of when that theory and those predictions might break down. But that is something that I think would be very interesting to explore in conjunction with a civil with a traffic engineer like RJ. RJ and I actually put together a proposal for NSF to bring together those theory, tools, and practices from civil engineering and my biological, ecological questions about relic structures. Uh, we sent it in together, and unfortunately, it wasn't funded. The engineer said, well, this is nothing new in engineering. This is not interesting. We already know how to measure these, you know, these particulates and flows. And then the biology people said, well, this is more engineering than it is biology, so sorry. So my hope is that as NSF is increasingly aware of the importance of interdisciplinary research, that we'll have the opportunity to pursue this. And I think really all it will take is you know, <clears throat> gathering some of the data that we need in terms of rates and directions of, of bird flow, so to speak, and then a collaboration with a traffic engineer who's willing to, to spend the time and energy it takes to provide those models which are already in existence uh, so that we can put those two together and perhaps explain and predict. And I mean, what I think of when I, when I dream about this in the future is that if we could answer that question about leapfrog versus clumped, we might be able to advise farmers who would be willing to say, yeah, I'll leave five trees up there. It's no skin. I'll have the shade is good. Tell me how to, tell me which ones. Tell me where to keep them. And that we'll actually have some science-based uh, knowledge to be able to inform that land manager or that farmer, yeah, definitely clump those. Or no, definitely space those out. So that's kind of an application that I can see in the future if we could get these answers in collaboration with some engineers who already have those to those tools available. Mark? So I'm also, I was also fascinated by the oh, goody. relic trees. Um, and I'm wondering, do you have any sense, I mean, you've been looking at these maybe not long enough, any sense of the persistence of those um, canopy communities in an isolated setting versus in a, you know, in a forest canopy and, and also whether they're Yeah, um, let me think if I can work this out. So some of the most recent work that I've been doing with a collaborator named Sybil Gotch and also Todd Dawson, whom you might know, who's, they're both uh, plant physiologists. And we have a grant from the IOS program of NSF right now in Monteverde where we're, they're looking at the ecophysiology of especially water use uh, of the epiphytes in these isolated trees versus the primary forest trees. And one of my graduate students, Autumn Amici, has been working with these relic trees um, in terms of looking at the biomass. Oops, I think I lost. Did I lose the slides? 
I, I'm looking at one screen here, <laughs> and I'm looking at a second screen here. So there definitely are two different screens. But I'd like them to. OK, but now I have to go to the bottom oh, of the okay. last slide, oh, like okay. the, near the last slide. Can I do that? Yeah. I really do have an answer here. Uh, <laughs> So what Autumn did, with the help of all of our arborist friends and so forth, was to take branches from the relic trees and from the, the primary forest trees, lower them gently to the ground, and then do inventories of all the species and morphospecies and the biomass of these different groups comparing relic to primary forest trees. What we found was they were similar. They were in, you know, we couldn't distinguish in terms of the numbers of species out there, the species diversity and species richness. But we did find more herbaceous epiphytes and shrubs in terms of our functional groups in the forest canopy of the primary forest. And we found more ericaceae and piperaceae in the primary forest. And not surprisingly, we found more vines and more bromeliaceae, which are sun-loving, phototrophic sort of things. Uh, in the, in the pasture trees. So these trees have been isolated for at least 50 years, probably more, because these were pastures that were established when, uh, when Monteverde was established by some North American Quakers. So we have documentation that they were there 50 years ago. We don't know how far in advance or how far later they might have been established. So for at least half a century, these trees can maintain a similar species diversity and richness, although some groups may be shifting in terms of their abundance. And what we haven't documented yet are, so as you mentioned, the genetic transfer of, of birds bringing in different species and so forth. So to my mind, I mean, maybe not in the life of geological time or even of forest time, 50 years may not be that long. But if, for instance, um, there's regeneration of pastures, and, and we know how quickly that can happen in these tropical montane pastures. Um, Karen Hall, for example, at UC Santa Cruz, sees these relic trees as what she calls regeneration nuclei, that they are places where birds come, they poop, or they barf up uh, seeds from the primary forest. And so around those trees, if cattle are kept out, you see this very rapidly growing returning forest. So if the epiphyte diversity can hang on until that that forest uh, um, increases, and along with that canopy seed bank I talked about of the regeneration of those, those host trees or those terrestrially rooted trees, um, then, it might, then I think a case could be made that these relic trees are not the, quote, living dead, which Dan Jansen called them, but rather they're repositories of biodiversity and potentially ecosystem function for the future. Yeah. There's definitely species turnover with elevation. And so when I showed you that, that schematic, that sort of cartoon, it looked like I was going halfway down the mountain, but the distance was, was less than a kilometer. And one of the cool, wonderful things about working in Monteverde is that you get these compressed life zones, that the input of mist and fog uh, comes in at a fairly distinct point, but you get these you get a, a very strong gradient with, with elevation in terms of the input of mist and fog over a very short distance. And so in terms of genotypes of, 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 of the epiphytes themselves, you're not moving them very far at all. So our sense was that we were moving them a fairly insignificant distance. And the difference, the only difference we were seeing was because of the relatively smaller amounts of mist and fog and the greater number of days without mist and fog during the dry season. So I think that although turnover absolutely happens with, with a, de a large decrease in, the, in an elevational gradient, and there's lots of studies that have documented that, I think what was going on here, because we did ascertain it wasn't the disturbance because of our control controls and our control controls, um, but it was rather this, this decline in mist that was, that was stressing these epiphytes, causing less productivity, causing lower longevity of life and so forth. 
Um, this, I think, could be tested in a lot of other different ways, but it was kind of a shortcut for me, who's an impatient person um, and who is sort of nearing the end of my tree climbing days, to be able to find out just, is there an effect? Can there, do they really rely on that mist? And the answer, at least for the four target species that we looked at, that in fact, that was a significant factor uh, in terms of their, their thriving, their survival. Yes? Um, you guys are asking such great questions. So here's another slide I just happen to have, which is about <laughs> secondary forests. Um, adjacent to these uh, primary forests in Monteverde, there are also areas where people have made pastures and have abandoned them. And so right in the primary forest <clears throat> and adjacent to it, there are a number of forests that are now about 50 years old. When I started work, they were about 25, 15 years old. And it was clear that they didn't have much in the way of epiphytes. They were basically bryophytes. There were a few staghorn ferns. Over time, we're getting more and more vascular epiphytes and a greater accumulation of dead organic matter. But just in terms of the study that we did in 2004, when we were assessing the biomass of epiphytes and the components of epiphytes in the primary forest versus the secondary forest, we found that instead of 33 tons per hectare, there was 0.2 tons per hectare in terms of epiphytes instead of 14% of the above ground biomass, 0.1%. And in terms of the foliar biomass ratio, which I pointed out was 4.4 of the epiphytes to the host trees, there was only 0.5 times. So second, these secondary forests take presumably a very long time to build up those, those giant, thick, delicious epiphyte loads that I was talking about. Um, and in terms of the sort of the micro scale, in terms of that, um, <clears throat> the, the branches that I stripped and so forth, again, we, we did see a succession. We didn't see encroachment from the side. And suddenly there were bromeliads that were on these bare branches. It was this, this thin scuzz that started on the bottom of mosses and liverworts. And as that accumulated and got up, sort of up on top, then we began to see little propagules of piperaceae, little tiny orchids, a little tiny bromeliads, which then started growing. And with that, then started accruing this, this dead organic matter and soil. So again, I think that is a project for some young graduate students who have time in their lives to dedicate themselves to understand that series of succession. Any other questions? Great. Well, thank you very much for your attention. I appreciate it.